The video you're about to watch has been designed to take you deeper, higher, and wider into Yahweh. Enjoy, and please subscribe. Thank you. Father, the journey that we're on right now, this regaining our France, going through the process of training, engaging with the seventh spirits, beginning to understand what it entitles to be recrowned after you've lost that dimension of authority, that dimension of life and fullness that you were originally intended for us to have. Regaining that authority, regaining that value, regaining that confidence, that boldness, Father, that zeal that we as sons and daughters of Yahweh need to carry in the earth mm -hmm. is what's about to change the nation. So, Father, as we go through these crowns and we get to regain what was stolen, what was lost, it comes back in a, in a manifold fullness that changes yeah. and aligns us to a deeper place of intimacy, a greater place of revelation, deep mysteries and secrets directed from your throne. But it opens up the gateways and the doorways in us that propels us to deeper places in the heavens. But in the same breath, it gives us an insight and a wisdom to understand what it means to legislate from out of the heavens into creation, where we begin to understand our place, our places that we are seated in, the dimensions of governance that we need to carry into creation, where Satan is seated in heavenly places. Those places is the places we are taking back yes. by force, aggressively. He has no right yes. to that which belongs to us. So slowly but surely, as we begin to understand our power of legislation, we're taking back what belongs to us. And Satan has only one place to sit and is under our feet. And Father, it's time that we begin to understand the value of the power that we walk in. So as the ecclesia goes deeper and deeper into revelation, you're beginning to share with us a deeper revelation of who you are. We are beginning to understand our place in creation, our place in you, and it's more than what we ever thought it is. Father, it's incredible, and we love you. We praise you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. I wanted to, uh, when, at the end, when we kind of go through our process of regaining uh, the crowns, then I also want to go on to, to the mountain of gold and go through that encounter. So I pray that I remember to do that. <laughs> okay, good, thanks. You guys are so kind and sound scared. <laughs> Okay, so last time we did two of the crowns, it was the crown of life and the crown of righteousness, am I right? Right. Yes. Yes. And before we start, I want to read the scripture. I want, to, I want you to kind of go into the scripture over the next couple of weeks as we do these crowns. Uh, and we might finish tonight, we might not, it just depends. There's, sometimes there's a lot of revelation coming through, and, and there was a time where I did the crowns over eight weeks. <laughs> but uh, as I went deeper into it, I realized that if I compact it a little bit, it almost makes more sense. Um, so the idea of everything I teach is for you to take portions of it and go into it. Yes. You know, we are now beginning to understand that the Word of God is more than what we, in our Greek minds, perceive. Mm -hmm. Because in our Greek minds, we want to study it. We want to quote scripture from Genesis to Revelation. We want to take things out of context. We want to do all kinds of weird things with the Word because we really believe that if we know the Word, that the scripture, that which is written, then we know Him. But we're beginning to understand that he's opened up dimensions of the word for us so that it's more than just what we read. Mm -hmm. And if we go in with a Hebraic mindset, we understand that as a spirit being, I get to go into the word and I get to engage in all three dimensions of it. Mm -hmm. I can go into that which is written and that which is written becomes alive to me and that which is written engages me into that which is spoken and it just opens up so much more to the word than what we've received previously. Mm -hmm. So it changes who we are. And so when I read this scripture again, I've probably read it a million times already. No, I always exaggerate that a little bit. How much is a million times? That's a lot. <laughs> I don't think it's been a million times, but you know what I'm saying, right? Then I turned to see who was talking to me. This is in Revelation 1 from verse 12. And when I turned, I saw seven gold lambs among the lampstands. There was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash around his chest, his head, and his hair was white like wool, in fact, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like glowing bronze refined in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of raging waters. In his right hand he had seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun when it shines in full force. Uh, you really have to activate your imagination to see what that looks like. The 
because that's not quite the scene. You know, um, Yeshua in the natural didn't have blonde hair, right? right? Um, in the natural, I don't have any hair. No, I actually do have hair, I just shave it off. So, and, and if, I, if I go with this scripture, this, it can't be me and it can't be Jesus. That's just the way my natural perception would perceive it. But I know that it's Yeshua because if you read the Bible, it's written in red. The word spoken was spoken as of as, as Yeshua was speaking it. But if you understand what it's really saying, it's saying someone like the Son of Man. So it's projecting an image here that he desires the church to walk in. An image that you are presented in in the spirit when you are walking in your full recovery. When you have your crowns, when you have all your mantles. We you have your battens, you have all that the Father has given to you, you've grown your fruits, you stand as a son in his kingdom, and you're beginning to grow in your kingship and your priesthood. You're beginning to understand that you're an oracle and a legislator, and how these two arc, uh, arc in the earth to open up what is coming from the heavens. So I'll go into more detail at a later stage. But it's for us to understand that regaining your crown is key to accessing what the Father has for you. You know, remind yourself in everything we do here, you are a king, and it is your responsibility to regain what the enemy has stolen from you, right? Yes. Okay, so we already did the crown of life and the crown of righteousness. So now we're doing the crown of glory, and we'll see how far we get, right? Mm -hmm. I am flappy lips, so sometimes it takes me a little bit longer to say some things that could have been shorter, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think I get it from my wife. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I saw on Sunday, I said to my wife, okay, that is time to go. All of a sudden, 45 minutes later, <laughs> we're still flat the lifting. She's talking, all of a sudden, I said, let's go. That's like, that's like key to start talking. <laughs> like everything you didn't say, the last two hours we were there, you want to start picking saying. <laughs> well, that's, that's what a preacher does as well, you know? Okay, well, let me just wrap this up. And then 45 minutes later, it's still busy. <laughs> okay, but the crown of glory. Now, I, I want you to remind yourself that there's, there's dimensions of glory, and there's all kinds of aspects to glory. So if there's a cloud of glory, there's now a crown of glory. And we have to kind of understand everything that the Father wants us to perceive regarding this. Um, the, the cloud of glory is the baptism into His presence. The crown of glory is that an aspect that manifests around you as you project the fullness of Yahweh in and over you. It's that the cloud that you cannot run from, if that makes any sense. Yeah. <laughs> when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. When, when the Christ in you begins to manifest around you, and you manifest God in the world around you as a king, then the crown of uh, glory is manifested and revealed in the spirit world. <laughs> now I want to remind you that it, it is literally a cloak that yes. I put on. Yes. You know, but also remind yourself in the same breath, the baptism into the cloud of Moses is your covenant agreement in the, what the Father presents to the ecclesia. It's a marriage covenant, but it's not marriage. Mm -hmm. So don't get excited, ladies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought, you know, ladies have it so easy in the church. They're going to marry Jesus, and that's just something normal to them. But the guys have to also marry Jesus. Yeah. It's like, uh, eh, eh, I don't know, that's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're beginning to understand it's not quite like that, right? So the marriage covenant is what we believe to be the Ten Commandments. If you understand the ketubah, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the ketubah is part of the marriage uh, contract between two people. It's just the one side. So Yahweh comes to the Israelites and he says, this is what I expect in this covenant. Right? And so we read the Ten Commandments. Now remind yourself that the Israelites comes out of 440 years of slavery. That's the mentality they have. I mean, the whole generation in the desert had to die out because of their mentality. They couldn't perceive the things that, that Yahweh is carrying them into because they were afraid of everything because they are so used to that mentality. Uh, I can't burp fart or cough without being killed. It's by order only. I can only do what they tell me to do. If I do anything outside of what they said, I'm dead. Because everything's a commandment. Everything is a scream and a shout. And if I do something wrong, I'm squashed, killed, or beaten to, to a pulp. Right. And that's the mentality they went into. So we are now being taught with that mentality from out of the scripture because that's what we perceive as the Greek. We only read it as it is instead of engaging yeah. the culture and understand what the culture wants to bring out. 
The culture was presenting a marriage ketubah. That's what Yahweh did. He appeared on the mountain in the cloud of smoke. And they rejected him. They said no. He said, will you marry me? They say no. We, we can't we'd be freaking us out. You know, yet he's already shown himself in everything over, over multiple amounts of years. But they still, when they physically see his, experience, his um, appearance, they freak out about it. What's supposed to happen in this covenant is the, that you're supposed to represent um, the, the marriage ketubah right back. So he's given his agreement in this marriage. You have to give your agreement in the marriage. That's what opens up the cloud of Moses. That's what opens up the dimension of glory that we want to step into. That's the crown that he wants you to carry, is to step into that place where you understand who you are as a king and his kingdom. A uh, deeper place of intimacy, more than just I am a son, more than just I'm a priest, more than just someone you pray to or someone you talk to. It's an engagement in to who you are, a position you have as a son in his kingdom, and how that carries you out into creation and changes where you put your feet. Come on. That's exciting, right? Ooh, that's good. It's the father calling a company of people saying, I want to show you who you are. Mm. Now Satan takes this crown because he knows that if if, if, if you lose this, people don't know who you are. Right. And you might say, well, I don't care what people think. <laughs> right? But in the spirit, you need to care. Right. It's not so much what people think, it's what the, the demonic realm looks at when they see you. Yeah. Right. you know, we've, we've gone through this already. Um, that it's a, a demonic entity and these guys are trying to cast them out, but they don't know Yeshua. They say to this demon, uh, we want to cast you out in the name of the God that Paul serves. In the name of the God that this guy serves. And then, and then he's like, well, you know, Paul, we know, Jesus, we know, but who the heck are you? Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to understand the Father wants you to be known in the Spirit. Yes. That's why it's not so much about the man with the power for the hour anymore. But about the guy that's got the mic in his hands and can do the signs and the wonders. Right. It's about the ones in the pews that have already been doing phenomenal things in the Spirit, carrying that glory, carrying that cloud. Of, of His righteousness, that cloud of life, that cloud of fullness of, of who we are as a son carrying His presence, Lord is carrying His presence. It's knowing the things that have been done in the Spirit, reflecting in the natural, but no one can see it. That's where the real true um, inheritance is. That's where the real gift of, of what the Father pours into the body is coming from. That's where the real life of what's happening in creation is coming from. Yeah. That which takes place in the Spirit. So you need to understand, this crown, these crowns, is what represents you in the spirit realm. Yes. When Satan looks at you, he says, Whoa, mm -hmm. I need to get out of here now. Mm -hmm. Right? The crown has got an incorruptible crown. And every man that strives for self control is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we uh, an incorruptible crown. This crown is represented by our personal yieldness to the life of God, doing His will, and the personal pursuit of His presence. Mm -hmm. Because unless you go into His presence, you will still remain corruptible. Come on. Now, I love this because this goes in hand in hand um, when it comes to the name of Yeshua, mm -hmm. or the name of Yahweh. I say the name of Yahweh or the name of Yeshua. Jesus tells us to pray in the name of Jesus, right? Um, and we need to begin to understand what that means. Now, I've taught on this before, so we have an understanding. is going into the Yad Hey Shen Vav Hey, Stepping into the name. Stepping into Yad Hey Vav Hey, Stepping into it. Not just calling the name out. Right. It's stepping into that name and understanding how that changes your DNA. It goes hand in hand with eating communion. Taking communion. When you're eating his body, you're eating or drinking his blood, you're stepping into him and he overshadows you with his DNA yeah. and he begins to reinstate your DNA according to what it is supposed to be. It's that recreation of the, the new being, mm -hmm. right? Where the oldest past and new, the newest come. It's understanding that now that you are in him, that eating and drinking of him, that covenant of oneness that we have with the body changes everything that we are. And imparts to you that dimension of incorruptibility where your mind has changed, your body has changed, your soul has changed, your fullness as a spirit being has changed. You begin to overshadow your soul and your body as a spirit being, mm -hmm. and you're living out of the kingdom of heaven, legislating that glory, that fire of Yahweh into creation. 
realigning things, propelling things back into place. Mm. And we understand that's a good place to be, right? Yeah. And we're beginning to understand that out of the name of Yahweh, we live out of the four faces. And I've shared this before, but I want you to understand that the four faces represent the um, priest, the king, the oracle, the legislator. Okay? The oracle is the eagle, the legislator is the ox. The priest is the man, and the lion is the king. Now, you have to understand that I can only bring two of those into creation. The rest has to stay in the kingdom of heaven. Mm. And it both forms an ark. So as a king and a priest, I need to understand there's no such thing, well, there is, but we are not kings. Uh, I can't be a king in this earth, physically. I can't be a priest in this earth, physically. You might say, yeah, okay, well, as a husband, you're the priest of the house. Yes, I understand. As a Christian, I'm a king. Yes, I understand. But um, we don't have a kingdom. Maybe in England, but I'm not going to become the king of England. Right. But I'm already married, and I'm not changing it for anything. Right? Uh, even in, in Belgium, in any other city that there's a kingdom that you can become king, it's not going to happen for us, right? So we understand that those two offices out of the order of Melchizedek uh, happen from out of the kingdom of heaven. And it forms an ark for the other two to come into creation. So as it forms an ark, I get to legislate, as a legislator, the things that I've experienced and walked in, in the kingdom of heaven, into creation. Mm. And I get to speak as an oracle. Now that overshadows the voice of the prophet. So you say, but how can it overshadow the voice of the prophet? The voice of the prophet is for the, for the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Yes, right. absolutely. It is a higher dimension of the prophetic voice on this side of the veil. Yes. On this side of the veil, I hear what he wants to say, and I interpret it as I perceive he's saying it. Come on. As an oracle, I speak as a voice piece, and a mouthpiece of Yahweh, and only say what I hear him say. Come on. It's slightly different. And of course, I live in the spirit where all things are revealed. It's not according to a gift. It's not according to a fruit. It's not according to something I've received in the natural or was taught. It's something that comes directly out of an infused knowledge through the Spirit engaging behind the veil in the kingdom of Yahweh, we hear shadows you with revelation that comes into creation and begins to change things as we speak into place. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other dimension of the fullness. That is the incorruptible capacity that we carry as sons, living from out of the kingdom of heaven into creation. Mm -hmm. Understanding that presence, that healed, the healedness to the life of God, doing His will, and the personal pursuit of His presence. Because unless you go into his presence, you will not remain, or you will remain corruptible. Mm. So it's that dimension of being in him, which I cannot be on this side of the veil. I can have a measure of it in my, in my uh, Greek perception, but I cannot have the fullness of being one with him as I could have when I'm in the spirit, as the spirit being one with him in the kingdom of heaven, right? Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> He's calling a company of people to understand what it means to be limitless. Yes. You know, we have to change our way of thinking. And of course, we understand through Scripture, the Bible never told us to think with our minds. Mm. To never use your brain to think. There's no Scripture that tells us to do that. Come on. And we're very religious because if the Bible doesn't say it, I'm not going to do it. Mm. But how many of you understand? We do so much out yeah. of the Word of God. Right. <coughs> and when it sits in our box, we will use the word, but if it doesn't fit in our box, then it's outside of God's word and it's not true. You know, but we, we forget that there's no car in the word of God. Oh. There's no glasses, reading glasses in the word of God. There's no high heels in the, in the word of God. There's all these what? things that we have today. What? <laughs> there's all these things that we have today that's really not in the word of God. As a matter of fact, I said before, Jesus, according to the word of God, has never gone to the toilet. Oh, hello. So there's some things we're doing that's outside of the Word of God that we see to be okay, and we keep on doing it, and it's no problem for us, but let's just speak of something that we don't perceive to be in the Word, then it's demonic and not from God. So there's something in us that needs to change. There's an alignment that the Father wants to bring to who we are that needs to change. So we have to change the way we think, yeah. and we have to think with our heart, and my heart is linked to my spirit. And my spirit in the kingdom of heaven, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So my thought patterns change because I'm one with him. He is my thought patterns. It's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. Right. Meaning when he's thinking, I'm thinking. What he's thinking, I'm thinking. The way he's thinking, I'm thinking. What he sees, I'm seeing. And so the thoughts and the pattern of my thought goes through my heart that activates my mind because my, it, it overshadows my, my soul, which is my will, mind, emotion, mm -hmm. which makes me beginning to think differently. That's why it says ponder on things above yes. and not on the things in the earth. Come on, 
because my, my being is not supposed to think with my brain. It's not the primary way of thinking. So that's what we've done because my soul has overshadowed my spirit all the days of my life. And now we begin to understand the value of the body, soul, and spirit. So as I divide my soul and spirit, my spirit and my heart begins to think in a whole different pattern. I change the way I think. That's what we understand to be a repentance, right? So it's not repentance of sin. It's repenting in the matter of uh, the way I think. Yes. Changing the way I think, beginning to think out of my heart and my spirit into my soul and my, my brain. Think differently. But it changes everything. The crown, the crown of the anointing oil. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the crown of the anointing oil of God is upon him. I am the Lord. This crown is given in the place uh, that we encounter his presence, the presence of God, in a deep relational way. Um, and it is mentioned by our daily connection, of, uh, maintained by our daily connection with God. You have to understand something. This is it's not so much entering into the glory. This is the face-to-face -face communication that the Father has been longing for. This is Adam and Eve walking with Yahweh in the garden, literally in the cool of the day, spending intimate time together, getting to know Him face-to-face, -face. not through studying the Word. I mean, I, 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 uh, me and my wife never really been apart, but I remember having a girlfriend that um, I met her, and all we did in the time that we met at first was we held hands, and I think we kissed once. Then she went back to school, and she was in a boarding school many miles away from where I stayed. So that, for three months, we only spoke on the phone. And I didn't get to hug her, hold her, kiss her, just spoke over the phone. I hope you understand, we didn't know each other. I knew a lot about her because we got to speak maybe for half an hour a day or more every other day. But we didn't know each other. It was like her writing letters to me and me reading the letters and now thinking because I'm reading a letter that she's written me, I know her. And we begin to understand that's not the knowing because the knowing is face to face. Yeah. It's the touch, it's the feel, it's the hug, it's the it's being intimate in a way that's not in a distance like we perceive Yahweh to be. Well, we can never see God if you see him, you die. And now we're beginning to understand why he's longed for a company of people to come so that he can be in our presence and we can be in his midst, we can be in him and he's in us and we yeah. get to know him face to face. Yeah. And the anointing increases not through the gift because we have believed for so many years that the gift is the anointing. But that means I understand the gifts are irrevocable. Right. So you can be in the midst of the worst sin of your life and still heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons. Come on. Because it's the gift that's operating in you that's given. There's people in the French quarters that is not even Christian, that say panic and demonic, yet they can tell your future. Yeah. They can prophesy accurately over your life, Why? tell you where you have been, where you are right now, and where you're going, and it will frame your future for you if yeah. you believe it. Yeah. But that's the power of speech, and it's not because they are satanic, it's not because they, it's because of the gift given to them. You know, we look at the new age, and they've got much truth, but we run away from the truth, and what they've really done is they've taken the original truth uh, that, it, that what it was supposed to be, or intended to be, out of the Christian faith, and they removed Jesus. Right. How many of you understand that the Father's desire for us to begin to go into all of what is truth and put Jesus in it? Amen. If they take Jesus out of the truth, they stole the truth. Come on. <laughs> we don't like that, but that's the yeah. truth because it's word spoken. But if I put Yeshua in it, it multiples, multiple, multiplies the truth and literally ignites a dimension of revelation that changes and aligns things. Amen. That's what the word is all about. That's what increases the anointing. So when I begin to walk with him face to face, I see him, understand him, perceive him. I walk with the seven spirits, and everything I engage in the kingdom of heaven is literally there to propel me in intimacy and face-to-face -face time with Yahweh. Come on. You understand this? In the Hebrew culture, you are, um, as, a, as a, a king's son, what will happen is you will have seven uh, test takers that will try and equip you <coughs> regarding the kingdom. Once they have individually trained you to all their full knowledge, you are sent to the king, and the king begins to direct you into your path regarding the kingdom and what you need to be doing in the kingdom. So we need to understand there's a company of people that have walked with the seven spirits, that have, been, uh, that have, that have received all the knowledge that they can pour into you for a season. Now, I'm not talking about myself. As of yet, I believe that there's much that I'm still gaining and learning from 
from the seventh spirit. But there is going to be a time and a season where the fullness of who Yahweh is is going to engage with a company of people where He Himself will be teaching and pouring into us. Where the anointing will become so increased and excessive yes. that as uh, Moses came down the mountain, lightning and fire, um, um, lightning bolts coming out of his face, him changing, lying off heel man, with horn-like appearances reflecting as he comes out of the mountain. That's what's going to happen. That's what the body of Christ is going to be projecting. Right now we're engaging with Yahweh in the garden, in different courtrooms, different throne rooms within the kingdom of heaven where the fullness of who he is is not quite reflected. It's a measure of who he is that's revealed to us. That's why my spirit can contain what he's bringing me because my spirit is open for all. Most of what he's revealing to us right now, our bodies can't take. Come on. But even my soul, my soul's got a glitch in some of the things that I'm receiving, but I can't receive it. Like, like uh, Paul said, uh, it's unlawful for me to utter the things that I've been shown, not because he wasn't allowed to talk about it, but because he did not know or had any record in his DNA for what he was seeing. Right. They saw the transformation of understanding what the Father is bringing into fruition. So as I begin to engage deeper and deeper, that's why I believe the Bible said that the... Uh, now, that the kingdom is taken by force. This is not something I can placidly do. They're chilling on the couch and just waiting for things to pan itself out. It's not going to pan itself out. Uh, you have to physically get up uh, and start doing things, understanding your job, your duty, and what needs to be released, and do it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start praying, and then I pray for five minutes, and I, I read the Bible three times a day, and I read three or four scriptures, or I can read a whole chapter. It's not the same as you going into the kingdom of heaven and having face to face time with Yahweh. Mm. And that's where the crown of anointing oil increases over you and people begin to understand who you are because it's a crown placed on you because of the revelation and the intimacy that you walk in, right? Yes. The deep place that I believe he's calling his people to is that desire he's always had to have a company of people looking at who he is and seeing the value in what he's pouring into a generation. Yes. You know, I want to go as far as to say, although every other generation before us had this available, it was never taught. Mm. You know, I'd always say, when I have $20 in my pocket, and I, I forgot about it, I, I'm never going to have that $20 until I find it. Right. Until I have $20, I'm never going to have it. I'm going to, I can stand without gas on the side of the road with $20 in my pocket and not knowing that I have any money on me. I can be right at the gas station without any uh, gas in and having no money in my pocket, not knowing about the $20 that's there. I have the $20, but I don't know about it, so I don't have that. Does that make any sense? And this is exactly where the Father has it. This has always been available. Uh -huh. Always. Not something new. It's always been available, but it's only being taught now. Now, I understand, in all of this stuff, we have to change our belief system. So it sounds really great and it's really awesome, but we can't engage to the full measure unless we change the way we think. <laughs> and I know that we're hammering the whole fact of going in, going in, and then of course 90% of the people that's listening to it on Facebook and YouTube don't and know because they haven't been here from the beginning, so it's like throwing uh, half the truth out because it's already far deep into it. But the idea is that we always have to understand that the gateways are open. As a matter of fact, we are the gateways. Yeshua is the gate. His blood is the doorway in. Uh, it's always been available. We have the access in and his desire is to pour into who we are from his throne room so we can legislate that glory to creation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, look, I listen to things that are happening in the church today. As a matter of fact, I've shared this a couple of times already since I came back, but I went to a church on, on the Sunday um, in San Diego, I think, and it was really it was a, a man of God I've always wanted to meet. He is incredible. I love him. I honor him. He was my very first experience with the fullness and presence of Yahweh it was amazing. It was uh, many, many years ago, 1996, when I first encountered the full presence of Yahweh, and it was mind-blowing. And I've always wanted to meet him, and I, I, I Googled him, and he was just missing, you know. But I, I kept on coming up with a person that was there, but I didn't know it was him because it was just different, you know. But anyway, I got to go to his church, and I was sitting in this congregation. I, I, I say this um, very flippantly, I understand that I'm... Uh, I love the church. I don't go to church because I have five meetings a week. You know, and then still go to church on a Sunday, and it's, it's, not, it's not what I'm called to do, right? I, I, uh, people say, what church do you go to? Why do you go to a church? Well, I am the church, and I have a ministry. I'm always in church. Every meeting I have is church. I can't still go to church. Well, that's all I'll be doing for the, for the whole week, you know? But I do go to church on occasions. Of course, I get invited to minister on Sundays as well. But, but uh, going to this church, and it was a normal church. You know, they have uh, three songs of worship. 
Then they'll take up the offering, and they'll do, they'll have three times to pray, um, tithes and offerings, then worship, and then they'll start ministering. So I was very basic. I grew up in a church like that. But I was, I just started crying. And I thought, <laughs> I didn't know why I was crying, because it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, anno- it was anointed, but it wasn't, that wasn't the reason I was crying. I was crying because I was sad. Looking at no growth for over 20 years. That we are so stuck in what we are used to that we cannot move to the next phase. That we are so holding on to the gifts that we cannot move into the spirit. That we just want to have what we had. And still go on and saying that this is the new. And we cannot move out of what we stuck into. Although what we are stuck in is great and everybody wants it and loves it. But we are not understanding the Father has more. You know, it drives me absolutely nuts. I was sitting there in tears. Eventually I had the opportunity to meet with this uh, legend of a man, and he's still uh, uh, absolutely incredible, very powerful man of God. And um, when I met him, because he is such a celebrity, you know, the first thing he asked me is, what, what do you ask, what do you want to ask me? What do you want? What's the question you want me to answer? Oh. <laughs> you know, just, yes. you know, and of course he's an incredible man of God, so I really honor him. But his father gave me a word. For him. Wow, that was a great song right there. Father gave me a word for him, and as I started prophesying over him, of course I prophesied from out of the kingdom of heaven, which is different, and uh, he just opened up and received every word I spoke to him. He fell down towards the wall, raised his hands up, and I got to prophesy uh, the intense next phase of his walk with Yahweh in and over him, into the church, into his ministry, into his life, over every aspect of who he is. Engaging with seven spirits, things he might have understood, he might not have understood. You know, many men of God don't show their true colors as part of the Come church, on. you know, because they can't teach the things that they walk in to the babies in the church. Come so they on. have to keep it for the leadership or they keep it uh, for themselves, you know. And uh, as I was ministering to him, he received every word of it. It was so encouraging for me to let him receive it in that manner. And afterwards, he asked me, my father, my spiritual dad, to pray over him. And I was so blessed. You know? And then afterwards, he's. Uh, um, assistant came to me and said, wow, that was exactly what he needed. That's exactly where he is right now. The word was spot on. So it was just encouraging. It was incredible to look at what the Father is wanting to do with a generation that is really, whether he's stuck or not, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think he is. I know that he does a lot of what he does with purpose and on purpose. But to just see the church stuck in one place and not getting out of it. Like that's the measure of the anointing. That's the measure of walking what the Father has, and that's all we can, we can look at. And it frustrated me, knowing that, well, there's more, because it's stepping into the Spirit, understanding the crown of the anointing, or where I uh, have the anointing and carry the valuable presence of Yahweh in me because of my relationship and intimacy with Him, not because of my gift. Woo! Well, you just picked up a new crown, and it is all over you. Oh, wow. Fire! Woo! Crown of rejoicing. Amen. Yes. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? It's not even you in the presence of our Lord Christ, uh, uh, Lord Jesus Christ as His coming. Listen, rejoicing, that's what it means. It means to have an overflow of joy with the ability to express it. The implication behind it includes shouts and expressions of joy. It's yeah. uh, really the Father just wants you to understand. I listened to, you, to Justin Abraham a little bit, and I love the way he says, he says joy is a technology. A technology that is designed to open gateways and doorways and to ignite you to these places, to bring healing, to open your eyes, to open your ears, to yeah. realign your body. Joy is what carries the anointing into its position. Nice. Uh, and we need to understand, Satan will do everything in his power to yeah. take that from you. And he also wants you to believe that happiness is the same as joy. I mean, understand it's not happiness to say a feeling, joy is position. Joy is an inside job. Yeah, inside job. He can't take that. So he cannot steal my joy. He can overshadow my joy with a feeling of sadness. Because he can only operate in that which is negative. So if I operate in happiness, he can bring sadness. But he can't take my joy. I, I, can, I, can, I can suppress my joy through lack of understanding, through the, this crown being lost. But I, he cannot take my joy. Come on. We need to understand the value of what yeah. we are. When you are in the spirit um, and that crown is on your head, you will have unsaved people come to you and say, Man, what, what is on you? Um, they feel the tangible reality 
in the natural world of the rejoicing. You know, this is just one aspect of it, but I remember sitting at the gym, I was a personal trainer there, and there was another personal trainer there, and he came up to me and he said, and I was just sitting waiting for my next line, and he's like, you are, you, you look so at peace. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, yeah, it's because Jesus is peace. And I, just, I realized that it's a tangible thing that people can see. I remember walking with a friend of mine. We went to the, the shop just across the road from the gym. Um, you know, you spent the whole gym. It's the whole day at the gym. That's a personal trainer waiting for your clients. And they come in, then one cancels, and you have to do nothing for another hour. Um, but we walk into the shop, and we come back. And, well, we haven't, we haven't spoken about Jesus. I didn't tell him that I was a pastor or a teacher or anything. I didn't say nothing to him. He just looked at me. He kind of stopped and looked at me and said, I hate walking next to you because I'm convicted of my sin. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't say anything. You need to come to me and go by yourself. Yes. And I believe that this crown uh, is something that is tangibly seen by the yes. unbeliever. Right. They know. You know, we sit in restaurants and, and we have fun just like the drunk people around us. And oh. the waiters would ask, did you guys drink before you came in? And we'll say, no, we actually drink the whole day long. Not understanding what we actually say, you know. Uh, well, you know, because that's something that people can see. Why are you so happy? What is it about you that is just so standing out? Why? Is there a reason why you're so happy? You know, I get that all the time. Why? You never, you never change. You're always the same. Isn't that nice? Mm. You know, and that's, I think, the key to carrying this crown. It's the Father bringing to you a realm of who He is, a characteristic that you carry of who He wants you to be, that is seen tangibly on your life as yeah. you carry the fullness of it. Now, if this crown is lost, we have to understand it's something that you need to replace above almost everything else. Now, of course, righteousness is the interlocking crown that uh, opens the position for everything else to fall onto. But joy is something that we, as saints, have to carry in its full capacity. That's the Father's desire. You need to have joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He gives you joy for mourning, and He returns your ashes into joy. You need to have joy. <coughs> The Father's desire for us to have revelation regarding what was taken. You know, it's so easy for us to just be bound to what we feel. You know, I can feel happy one day and sad one day. You know, in my house, if my if my kids are sick, I feel sad. Yeah. You know, it feels like it feels like I've lost my joy because that's something that I have to work in, and I'm constantly overshadowing them. I'm constantly thanking Yahweh for everything He does. I'm constantly going through this process. I just overshadowing my family because I've noticed and seen in my life how anything that happens against them affects me. So subconsciously I always think, well, if Satan's going to attack anything in my life, not that he has any right to or I've opened any gates for him to do so, but if he has to think of anything to attack, it will be my family because he knows how that affects my my happiness. But realizing that my happiness is only but a feeling, it's not what I base my life on. Oh, it's being a son of Yahweh, walking in the joy as I have gained and regained this crown. Yeah. Satan cannot take from me. He might take my happiness and turn it into sadness, but he cannot take my joy and turn it into anything. Oh, he can only have me suppress it in a form or fashion, but it always comes back in its full force. That's why I might feel bad today, but that's not about my feelings because it's just a little by faith. That's right. You guys okay? Yes. So it's desire for us to really have this knowledge of what we carry. To regain this is to regain your strength. That's right. Mm-hmm. The last crown. It's this, let me just make sure you are. The servant king crown. The last crown that Jesus is going to place upon your head is the servant king crown. The interlocking crown. The fair mirror that is set upon your head when you go into heaven. God wants us to learn how to be kings. Unless you are carrying your crown, you will never become a king. A king wears crowns. Mm. Not only can we carry them, uh, and devils can see them, but you can trade them in the heavens. Mm. Mm-hmm. And we understand, knowing that you're a king, and having the revelation of your kingship, changes everything. And this crown is what puts you in the position to govern and to have authority as it was given to you in its full measure to be the legislator into creation. That is, to be reminded that the call creation is calling out to is the king. Because it is the sons of Yahweh. Once you're a son, you instantly fall into the category as king, lord, legislator, oracle. But it's becoming the son and then understanding your kingship. 
And so the Father wants you to understand that he has placed a crown upon your head that puts you in a position that everything and everybody knows exactly what you look like. Mm. It is the scripture all over again. I saw someone like unto the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash around his chest. <coughs> his head and his hair were white as wool. In fact, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like glowing bronze with stones in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of the raging waters. And in his right hand he had the seven stars. Now, if you read the scripture further on, it talks about the seven stars and what it represents, and it talks about the double-edged crown and what it represents. But, in the same breath, remind yourself that the seven stars always represents, as well, the seven spirits. The saying that you, for you to be in this dimension of light, to look like this, you have had got to walk with the seven spirits. And we are beginning to understand the seven spirits. We've never taught the seven spirits yet, have we? Not yet. We will soon. But the seven spirits represent seven colors of the rainbow. Right? And if you take the seven colors of the rainbow and you spin them around uh, at 2,800 breaths per minute, it turns into white. Mm -hmm. Now that's exactly what happened with this image. It is the walking with the seven spirits that turns us into pure light. That we begin to understand the value of what we stand in. And of course, the two edged sword is the understanding of the dimensions of the word of God with that engagement into intimacy with Him. That just changes everything, that's what comes out. You know, if I think about it, the two edged sword is not going to come out of Jesus' mouth because He is the word. He is the two edged sword. You know, so is the inter interpretation of this uh, revelation of the word wrong? No, it's not. There is more than one interpretation, there's more than one. A visual understanding of what's being released here. And so we need to look at things from different angles. You know, that's something the that Father showed me in my walk with Him, is that I can look at one situation from several different angles and see many different revelations in one thing. And I want to remind you that as you read scriptures today, that same scripture means this to you. And as you grow deeper into a relation and intimacy with Him, that same scripture means something else tomorrow. Yes. And as you grow deeper in intimacy and revelation, that same scripture means something else tomorrow. Why? Because it's meat, you know, mis uh, milk, meat, mystery. That's right. It's growing deeper, things change. Growing deeper, things change. Exciting, right? Yeah. So it really wants us to understand the value of what it means to be a king and how all of this comes back into fruition for you to stand within the kingdom of heaven as king seated on your throne, more than one throne. How do you understand that? Yes. We are called to be co-heirs with him, co a co in co-creation with all things that are still happening and still need to happen and needs to be co-governing with him everything that he wants us to govern with him starting with creation, because this is what is given us originally to govern, right? So we're beginning to understand what we need to govern. And I hear people in the church saying all this, they say it the whole time. We need to give, um, um, we need to give our nation back to Jesus. And Jesus is trying to give the nation back to us. We don't understand that. We have given the nation to Jesus, and he's saying, okay, well, you don't understand. I have given you dominion, and I've given you authority over creation. In me, in my name, not speaking my name, not giving it to me. It's already mine, but I gave it to you. Now, you need to govern it in me. That's why the veil was torn. That's why Jacob had a ladder to go up. That's why it's always been available. It's always been desired for us to understand that where we live, we legislate from. And we have to understand it. And my, my father has spoken to me this many times. So he said to me that you never want to minister in the city that you stay in. Because you want, don't want to be in it, you want to be over it. Now, so, um, for us to understand this, he's given us governance over the earth, saying that we're aliens. Now, that doesn't mean that you're the green man with long fingers. Right. Like he's saying, you're not supposed to live in the earth. This is not your place of residence, this is your place of governance. This is the place that you have authority over, the place you have dominion over, the place that you need to, to uh, have dominion, uh, 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 sovereignty over, that you are to rule. That's why you're a king. See? The king of kings and kings have uh, places to rule within creation. Now, up to this point, he's given me several states in this nation to govern. He's given me states in South Africa, my own nation, to govern. He's given me different sections of European countries that I'm governing. Now, I don't always understand all the things. I'm still a, 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 a 
toddler in all of this, a baby in all of this, but I know what he's given me. I can experience into my spirit and in walking in the, in the kingdom of heaven. And slowly but surely I'm being taught how to govern the sections of the aspects in my life according to my scroll that I need to do and govern in the earth. How I need to bring it into place, how I need to bring it into solution. And slowly but surely I'm beginning to understand who I am as a king in creation. Mm-hmm. But that's what this servant king crown is all about, understanding your position in what the Father has placed upon your shoulders. Mm-hmm. Of course, it's more than what we can perceive, it's more than what we can understand. But we're walking in it, and so slowly but surely it's going to bring us to that place. Mm-hmm. Restoration of crowns. Hmm. Okay, so what is the process of restoring the crowns that you have lost? And I've said this before, you need to recognize the place that you've lost it. You do this by memory recall, thinking what it was like back then, if you can remember, if you ever even had this crown. Mm-hmm. Some of us just never had the crown. Right. You know, we don't even understand if we had the crown, how do you use it? That's why you lost it in the first place. <laughs> so if you don't use something, you're going to eventually lose oh, it, right? That's right. But someone's going to take it. And I've noticed because we, in South Africa, we have uh, um, cleaners living in our house or coming to our house on a weekly basis. Yeah. I've noticed if there's things in our house that we don't use, it gets stolen. Oops. And that's kind of how it works, right? Is that okay, yes, I had it, and what happened? What was the, the circumstances that occurred that allowed this to be removed from your life? You must go back and spend time praying in the Spirit, drawing on the memory uh, with two things in mind. What was it like to wear it, and uh, what was it like to lose it? This helps you to recognize the price you pay to, uh, in losing your crown. Mm-hmm. It's something you have to want to do, right? Mm-hmm. <coughs> then the thing we don't want to do is we have to repent. You are the one that lost your crown. You need to own that fact so that you can repent of losing it. You are the one that is the, the problem, not God, not the circumstances around you. That's you right. just need to take some responsibility, right? Uh-huh. That's where the priest comes into play that part of who you are. Okay, you need to restore it by faith, which means by praying something like, Father, by faith today I take hold of what crown was removed uh, from my head in uh, that circumstance. His desire is to see it as you go to the Spirit and regain that value upon you as you start walking in what you are as a king. You need to rebuild what you've had. Um, When Jerusalem had their walls torn down, they had to go and rebuild it, right? And that's the same thing. Uh, we need to, we need to um, reaffirm by prayer the restoration of that crown. Father, thank you for the crown of righteousness, or which one of the crowns that is on my life. It's the Father's desire for us to step back into all of what was taken. And, and if we remind ourselves of what the Word says, He wants to replace everything sevenfold. Amen. Everything that was taken, everything that was Amen. stolen. And that's exactly what happens. Once I regain my crown, I get to go to the sea of God and trade mm-hmm. Um, my friends, lay down at his feet. And when it comes back to me, it comes back fully restored in the position that it was originally meant to be, Amen. which changes everything, Amen. right? Cool. So Thank you, you can, you can say, Pete, that what I want to do is I want to go into the spirit realm and I want you to uh, take the crowns that you have and let's go through a process of regaining, uh, not regaining, trading it at his feet and letting him give it back to us in full solution and then go from there so we can engage with favor. Tell that again so Michelle can engage. She'll, she'll have it, she'll get it. We're going to go and we're going to regain, or we, we've already regained our crowns. We're going to go into the sea of glass and the spirit and we're going to just lay our crowns at his feet. And of course, that's not something I'm going to so much. Uh, take everybody through, that's something you want to do uh, in your own engagement, you know, finding yourself at his, at his feet, at, on the sea of glass, understanding that the sea of glass is not actually made of glass, right? It is, it is a sea, we don't stand per se on it, it's a place of fire and stones where he waits for us to come and lay things at his feet. It's a sacrifice, that's where, which he doesn't, he doesn't ask anything of us, but we're beginning to understand that the sacrifice is uh, what opens up the gateways and the doorways to bring the full fruition of what? He wants us to come or, 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 or have in full solution, right? <coughs> Father, right now, as we, we literally shift from the kingdom of earth into the kingdom of heaven, remind yourself of your spirit being the kingdom of heaven at hand, 
Um, you do not have to go travel in the spirit to get there. You're shifting into the kingdom of heaven. You are seated in Christ in heavenly places. And what you want to do is you want to find yourself standing. This is what I like to do. I stand on the water of the sea of glass. And I see in front of me these stones of fire around a throne. And whether it's the throne, I don't believe it is, but it's around a throne. There's multiple amounts of fire with stones, just as the water breaks on the front of it. I get to walk on these stones, and of course, anything fire represents dimensions of revelation. As I start walking towards the throne on these fiery stones, I have these crowns that I regain after Satan has stolen. And now I'm not walking in full fruition of any of these crowns per se, but as I enter into this fiery stone, um, as I start walking towards the throne of Yahweh, I take off these crowns and I lay it at his feet. And I want you to see yourself do it. It literally gets absorbed into him. And then it's almost like you feel half naked. You've just taken off your crown and laid at the feet of Yahweh, the one you worship, the one you glorify. And it's like giving something that's valuable to you away and now you don't have it anymore. But almost immediately, he re-establishes each one of these crowns in its full force back onto your head. Re-establishes you as king in the kingdom that that you have been called to, and he literally propels you back into full force. Mm. I want you to find yourself slowly but surely shifting from this position back onto the mountain of gold. Now, we haven't done it at this specific meeting yet, so what I want to do is I want to go to the chamber of, of favor. Now, we've engaged the chamber of love, hope, faith, honor. Tonight we're doing favor. And we remember that honor was a being, not an angel, but we went through, and as we go through it, the doorway in the chamber, there was many other doors that we get to choose the door to go into, that we go on your own journey. We came out of that door, we would were, we were receive a mantle. Now, favor is different. As you walk in with favor, favor places a mantle on your shoulders, which means from this moment on, you carry a dimension of favor. So I want you to find yourself in this, in this I say, an alley, uh, um, a, a valley, a, an aisle, whether it's inside, outside, it looks like it's inside, outside. You've got a beautiful part of nature, you've got beautiful furniture on the side, diamonds, ruby skulls, these doors are absolutely incredible, and you've got all these beings standing by the doors. And favor, again, I don't believe that it's an angel, but it's a being, and literally a being called favor. And as you walk past, he places a, a, a cloak on your shoulders that opens up every gateway and every doorway in your life that represents anything you need favor for. As you go into this chamber, it is like it's consumed with favor. It's consumed with the fullness of the glory of Yahweh, and it's like a, a pounding vibration into your being, like a frequency uh, alignment in who you are, like everything in you starts vibrating in a different way. You find yourself at the, the fountain of favor, and you just literally jump into that there is a river flowing, and from the river comes a fountain. You want to jump into it. You want to soak yourself in favor. You want to find yourself full of it. Slowly but surely, you're coming back out. You're looking around. You can engage what you see. You might see many different things. It's, 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 I don't want to go into detail what I see. I want you to see your own thing. I want you to have your own engagement from this moment on. But eventually, the idea is to remind yourself that in the chambers, each one of these chambers, starting with love, as we walk through the angel, we walk past the angel of uh, called Agape, we want to walk through the angel called um, hope and, 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 and faith. We understand that within the chamber of, of faith there was a being called faith. It shifts our dimension of faith as we travel through the different areas of our faith, from the beginning right through to engaging with the actual person of faith. We understand going to uh, right through honor, begin to understand that honor is the key. Then we go into favor, and in this chamber, the Father is literally aligning a frequency in your being that opens up gateways of favor everywhere you go, that realigns you, propels you. You should be beginning to see from this moment on how doorways and gateways in your life opens up financially, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, in your business life, in your family life, and in every aspect of who you are, wherever you go, whatever you do, there's favor. People will see it on you. It will be like a, a dress you're wearing, a, a, a coat you have on. It will be tangible and visible. Slowly, I want you to start moving out by the door, Find yourself ascending back onto the mountain, and slowly but surely come back into the atmosphere. When you come into the atmosphere, remind yourself that because of where you've been right now, you are full of His glory, full of His fire. You've engaged Agape, you've engaged 
uh, the mention of hope that we have never failed to shadow in this measure. We've engaged so much uh, of faith that we can feel it just vibrating, pulsating in our beings. You have engaged honor. You have engaged honor. You have engaged favor. And I want you to come into the atmosphere and breathe all of that into your family life. Begin to overshadow your family with that dimension of the fullness of what the Father poured into us in his chambers. Find yourself going into your neighborhood. Breathe. Expand your spirit. Expand your spirit over your city. Breathe it into the city. Expand your spirit over your state. Breathe it into the state. Expand your spirit over the nation and breathe it into the nation. And as far as you can expand your spirit, breathe it into the atmosphere. That's part of aligning creation. Bringing all that we've experienced in the heavens into place so that things can start falling into alignment according to what the Father has for us. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for who you've made us to be and who we are in you, Father. We worship you, we magnify you, we give you all the glory, we King, you are majestic. Yeshua, you are our Lord and our Savior, and we thank you for the life that we have in you and the fullness of your glory and fire that's inside of us, Father. The capacity we have to bring things into place and into alignment according to what's destined for this time and season right now in its full measure. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you, Yahweh. Amen.